Hello, I'm Gabriel Del Santo and I'm the creator of Pro in the Dev. If you're new to Pro in the Dev, then nice to meet you and welcome to this group. Now, this video, it contains some of the most important takeaways from the first global conference on professional indie game development, which was an event that I have organized with some of my peers in the industry uh, in 2018. There, I basically invited a bunch of my friends and other professional indie developers uh, and together we shared our experience on what it takes to make indie games not as a hobby, not as maybe something that you do together with your, uh, with your daytime job, but hopefully eventually as a full-time profession. So how do you get there? How do you become financially sustainable? What are the things that you have to take into account from a mindset perspective, from a production perspective? And all that and I'll be showing some segments and I think they focus focus mostly on the mindset the things that you need to pay attention to to start uh, becoming really productive in your interaction with pro in the dev and hopefully in starting transforming your game dev all the way to you effectively like selling games and making games consistently and meeting the market expectations and all that right but this is like a big thing it's a big subject that will have to be discussing uh, in parts so Keep an eye on your email if you are subscribed to Pro Dev because that's uh, all we talk about. Now, I decided to start by showing a segment of my conversation with Edmund Macmillan because everyone knows him, right? He's super successful. He was in Indie Game, the movie. He launched Super Meat Boy, The Binding of Isaac, a bunch of other games. Recently, he had a very successful uh, multi-million dollars Kickstarter campaign. So it's obvious that this is a very talented guy. This is a very, this is someone was not really relying on luck because he has consistent results, right? He couldn't be a lottery winner like 10 times. So this is a very skilled developer that everyone knows about. Now, if you have the opportunity to be friends with successful developers, then you will know that actually everyone has a history, right? So many times we think that the game that we know that person for is their first game. And so we have this illusion. And the problem with that, this thinking or this mindset is that it takes you takes your attention away from the things that must be done to get there, right? So this is what I was discussing with Edmond in this segment. Um, and uh, I was in Indie Game the Movie, which is a lot of people know me from, visually from that. Um, and uh, I probably made close to 28 Flash games, um, a few of which were pretty popular in the... Uh, in the in the late 2000s mid to late 2000s um and i've been doing this for like technically I, I guess i've been making games for about 18 years seems like a long time now has this ever happened to you someone coming to you and saying hey uh super meat boy is great i mean it's so you are so lucky to be so successful in your first game oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean I, I i hear a lot of like people that assume that that was that was it it's funny too because even in the movie like it's most people will see the movie and they'll be like, ah, oh, your first game did so well. And that was like, wait, that movie actually did talk about the games that I made <laughs> before that. Um, but it's, it's hard. It's hard to not like, I mean, that's kind of the success story that a lot of people pitch. Like you never, you never talk about the failures. You never talk about all the work that went in and all the sacrifice. You just go right to the win um, because that's what everybody wants to see. And um, you know, no one talks about the, all the, all the bits and pieces that actually matter, like the, the building blocks to kind of get you there. Um, you know, everybody has a history. Unless, unless you're a complete lucky wild card that just falls out of the sky with your first game that, you know, <laughs> there's no way that there, there's probably a bunch of people around you that also had a lot of experience helping you. Thank you, Ed, once again for the talk. It was really great. Edmond has been supporting Pro in the Dev since the very early days. Now, Edmond is one of those perseverance champions who managed it to be for like over a decade making games uh, and working really hard without making money until uh, uh, until things started clicking for him. And then he started seeing like the metrics and learning the patterns and applying them so that he was consistently successful, right? And that was my case as well. That was the case of many indies that nowadays are capable of living off of their games, right? So now the next segment that I chose to show comes from Ryan Clark's presentation. Ryan is the creator of Crypt of the Necrodancer, a bunch of other successful games recently has signed a deal with Nintendo for a crossover uh, with his, between his game and uh, the Legend of Zelda franchise, which I think is unheard of for an indie developer. Ryan is a very smart person. He's very deliberate about how he plans his games. 
and he tends to think in a way that's very similar to how I plan uh, my initiative. So I think it's very interesting to hear from him because it feels it serves like a some uh, broad strokes introduction to many uh, to much of what you'll be seeing in the pro in the dev group. Well, I became a full time indie developer back in 2004, and since then I've made 10 games, eight of which were profitable, with three grossing in the millions. Uh, four of those were nominated for IGF awards, and one of them won a Game Developer's Choice Award. I have an explicit strategy that I've used to achieve this level of consistency, so let's get started. This is a screenshot from a game called Airscape The Fall of Gravity. One of its developers posted an article on Gamma Sutra discussing its poor sales. It seems that, despite everyone giving them positive feedback and reviews, the game only sold a few hundred copies. The developer concluded that a good game isn't good enough, and I wholeheartedly agree. Unfortunately, Airscape just doesn't have any big hooks, nothing that really grabs you. It's a good game in a sea of good games. I think the method used by many newcomers will generally produce good games like this, but not noteworthy games. It's common to take a look at successful Game X and see various flaws in that game, and decide to make Game X but better, or Game X but in space. But what should we be doing instead? Well, by my estimates, 95% of indie games don't make a profit. If you are not confident in being able to explain why the hits hit and why the others did not, you shouldn't be confident about your game's chances either. I know that's a rather frightening statement, uh, but please do think about it. You need a reliable strategy if you want to be consistently in that profitable 5%. And if you don't have such a strategy, you need to be honest with yourself about your chances. Okay, this is super important if you are moving from making your own games to making your own games with a professional commercial intention, right? Uh, understanding what are the specific traits, the specific characteristics in games that are very successful that made them be uh, extremely successful, right? You need to be able to open a Steam page from a game that's not successful and understand what, what it's lacking. Understand what could be changed so that that game would draw more attention, right? So this is what Ryan is talking about and is a big part of the focus here in Pro Indie Dev. Now, next, I'll be showing a little bit more of the talk that Ryan uh, prepared for Pro Indie Dev because it touches very specifically on, on one of the main subjects, one of my favorite subjects, which is one aspect of marketing that most indies don't even understand exists and it's probably the most important thing that you can do for your game's marketing for how much your game will sell and that is understanding what is your game's surface right and now i'm talking in pro indie dev terms right this is the term that i use when giving consulting uh, on in my own studio and with my students right but a game's surface is everything in a game that actually affects marketing, right? We can consider that like 95% of the work that you do in your game is not something that will help sell that game, right? So these are things like balancing your, uh, maybe your difficulty curve, or maybe like the secrets that you'll be revealing throughout the game, the ending of the game. There's a bunch of things that are really important for making a good game that nonetheless will not really affect how much that game will sell, at least not directly. At least it will not affect how attractive that game is for someone who's just using a trailer and maybe a short description or a thumbnail to decide whether to learn more about that game or, or not, or whether to buy that game or not, right? So those 5% that affect uh, your game's uh, sales directly, this is what I call a game's surface. And you need to be very deliberate about how you plan that particular aspect of your game. Right, so you need to become an adapt of looking at successful games and figuring out which are the aspects that makes that you know create a very attractive surface for those games. Now, I use a term that's attention magnets or marketing magnets to uh, refer to these things that draw people to your game, right? And you see me discussing this on different occasions. Now, Ryan has a very similar concept. Uh, actually, part of what I incorporated into what I teach came from some insights from Ryan on what he calls hooks. To be successful these days, it helps a great deal if your game stands out. If you want people to remember your game, to talk about your game, and to write articles about your game, it needs to have a hook, preferably multiple hooks. In music, a hook is a short riff or melody or phrase 
that really grabs the listener and gets stuck in their head. In games, a hook is similar, but game hooks often take effect before the game is even played. The hook is something, some interesting bit of information about the game that compels people to try it or to discuss it. By way of illustration, I'll describe some hooks from Crypt of the Necrodancer since the design fortunately provided quite a few. First, the game's name is a pun. Some people hate puns and some love them, but at the very least the name is memorable. Rock Paper Shotgun said, Crypt of the Necrodancer is called Crypt of the Necrodancer, which already makes it incontrovertibly the greatest game of all time. Uh, the game's core mechanic is also a hook. The term roguelike rhythm game sounds impossible or crazy, which immediately gets people interested. The game has an excellent hooky soundtrack written by well-known composer Danny Baranowski. Star power itself is a hook. That's why celebrity endorsements in advertising actually work. And our singing shopkeeper is also a fan favorite and gets people talking. But the point is, the people on your team themselves can be hooks. The game's art, while it is pixel art, has personality. People often comment on the hip-thrusting dancing skeletons. And we even had a hook at conventions like PAX. You can play the game with a dance pad. This is unusual, so the dance pads at our booths always drew large crowds, and the crowds in turn got the attention of any members of the press who might have been walking by. Now, not all hooks are created equal, of course. I think Necrodancer's core mechanic and excellent music are its most powerful hooks. But the more hooks you have and the more compelling each hook is, the greater your chance of snagging a given person's interest. So many people think about marketing in terms of those promotional things that you do after your game is complete, or maybe like tweeting screenshots of your game throughout development, and that's it. That's what marketing is about, right? Designing from the get-go to have something that's hooky, something that has magnets, something that has a strong uh, surface, this is even more important than the promotional effort that comes afterwards, or maybe just as important, because in the end, uh, your game's uh, outreach will be affected by both things. So if you need to make some changes, or if you need to move on to the next thing, whatever the case, only you can know that, but rest assured that we are all here, all these developers are here, Pro Indie Dev is here to help you figure that out and to support you if you need, right? Now, I know that even considering making drastic changes to our projects can be quite scary. Everyone feels like that, right? Even the most successful developers in the world can uh, doubt their own skill, their own abilities. And what you need to do at that moment is be smart and play smart with what you have, right? So to reinforce that a little bit, here's my friend Edmund McMillan once again. You know, I'm not the most skilled person in the world at anything, but but I am at least honest about who I am and I try my best to do my best. <laughs> like, and um, I've stood the test of time and over time you, you develop, it's just, it was just a, a fan in the right place. Like someone at Microsoft really liked my work and they wanted to work with me and they didn't reach out to me. I reached out to them, but they still was like, Oh, you know, I know this guy. I like his stuff. I believe in what he's doing. And that's what it was about. And, and um, that's kind of how, that all really started for me, but I, I definitely feel that. Like I remember, I remember throwing my hands up. I was when I, we had just started working on Super Meat Boy, and I was still working on um, a remake of Gish for Xbox, which never, which never happened. And then I was told that a, a prominent indie developer that seemed to fall out of the sky, you know, and he was blowing up around that time, um, had gotten a ton of funding from the Canadian government, and that was getting just like uh, a bunch of like money and it was just like oh, i have no money like what the fuck am i supposed to do and it's just like i i just every time i hit that wall of like this is too hard everybody else has it so easy it's so easy to do these things for everybody else um i just went back to the well i'm just gonna try to work harder and that's kind of what it was it was knowing my limits and pushing them and just pushing forward and sacrificing and sacrificing and working harder and harder and harder, but not in a stupid way. Like I wasn't ever like, um, I have this much money in savings. I'm going to gamble on this idea. It was like, I'm only going to gamble on things that I know have the highest probability of working. All right. Now to wrap things up during the project Dev conference, there was this crazy scenario that we call the Brian scenario where that I basically asked it to my friends in the industry. Uh, I described it a very strange, very weird situation just to try and dig some uh, powerful advice tailored for indies that might be in a situation where they are trying to find what to do next, 
right? So uh, this was uh, just for fun, but it really led to some deep answers. And I decided to share as the last segment for this video, uh, part of my conversation with Mike Vito, the creator of Thomas Was Alone, a very successful game from 2012. So uh, in this next segment, I will describe what this weird Brian scenario is, and then you see Mike's answer. An alien race takes over the earth, right? And they, they will kill everyone unless a guy named Brian, who is an aspiring game developer, becomes really good at making games in maybe two years from now. And they, they kidnap you, Mike. That's a very specific. <laughs> That's a very likely scenario. Actually, I crafted some data and this is about to happen. This is, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very <laughs> It's so obviously going to happen. Yeah, don't yeah, carry on. It's very realistic. I, I, I took extra care with that. But anyway, they lock you and Brian into a room, and this alien overlord comes to you and say, Hey, Mike, you can give any advice to Brian. And in two years from now, if he's able to, to come up with really good games or actually finish really good games uh, by then, then humanity save it. Otherwise, we'll just kill everyone. And Brian doesn't want to die, he doesn't want Earth to explode. So he will do exactly what you say, exactly what you say. He will just obey you, would you uh, outright? He won't ask questions. So if you say, Brian, do this systematically for two years, you'll be a much better developer, and we have better odds at surviving this alien apocalypse. What kind of advice would you give to Brian for him on how to spend those two years? Okay. Um, <laughs> I like the scenario. First of all, I think Brian should make a game about that. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think the biggest advice is. Is, is Brian should start making games immediately. Um, I think a lot of the time we, we sit and we ponder the big idea we want to make one day. Forget that idea. You'll make that one day. Start making stuff now. Make little, terrible little games. You know, make Pong. Make whatever. Just start making stuff. Um, and because the act of making is the way you learn. That's the first bit of advice. And a lot of people say that. Just make games. And but you should. You should make big games, small games. Make games. Um, but what I would also say um, to Brian, <laughs> my mate Brian, would be um, you don't have to do this alone. You know, by the alien's definition, he has to get better. Doesn't say he has to work on his own. Um, and actually, I'd say one way Brian could get better much quicker is if Brian surrounds himself by really talented people. And that might be Brian starting a little indie meetup in Brian's hometown. It might be Brian joining a company. It might be Brian, um, uh, if Brian, you know, is quite shy and doesn't want to get involved in that stuff, maybe Brian just is going to find some really good forums and be a part of or follow some clever people on Twitter. But Brian should get involved and, 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 and go past himself because Brian, Brian needs teachers, you know. Um, if, you're, if you're only listening to yourself, if you're only thinking in your own bubble, um, you're not going to learn. You're going to be as clever as you are, which is not progress. You want to surround yourself by people who are smarter than you. Um, so Brian should seek that out. He should find the right people um, who are going to kind of push him. All right, and that's it for this video. So thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you on the Pro New Dev in Ale. Take care.